PC, can you hear me? OK, thanks a lot. My name is Sebastian Walker. I'm soon to leave Haiti. It was an earthquake that brought me here. A disaster that, according to the United Nations, killed at least 220,000 people and left more than one and a half million homeless. My assignment was for two weeks, but I stayed for more than a year as Al Jazeera's correspondent. Clear DC? Yeah. During my time here, I've witnessed people struggling to recover from an earthquake, violent weather, and then disease. But the stories I filed for Al Jazeera were not only about natural disasters. I didn't know much about Haiti when I first arrived, but I've learned that it's also man-made tragedies that have shaped this country into what it is today. On the 12th of January 2010, in less than a minute, Haiti was broken apart. A nation and its people suffered devastating destruction. The world responded to the crisis with a promise to put Haiti back together again, better than before. For me, this story began on the approach to an abandoned airport. Al Jazeera had chartered a small twin-engine plane from the Dominican Republic. We were met by radio silence from air traffic control in Haiti. But coming into land, there was little evidence that a magnitude 7 earthquake had just rocked the country to its core. I remember getting off that plane and looking around and being struck by the fact that there was only one other aircraft on the tarmac, a cargo plane from Venezuela. That was the only sign of an international response to the disaster at that point, more than 12 hours after the earthquake had hit. With no rescue teams in sight, we realized we were on our own. We headed into Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince, as night was falling. In those first days, the sheer scale of the death and destruction was unlike anything I'd ever seen. I've reported from war zones in my career, but this was the first time that I'd been lost for words at what I saw. This, this man speaks yeah. a little bit of English. Hey, we need something, we need something. There is nobody. We need help. Where is the police? Or There's no hospital. There's no, no people capable to support us. We need something. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, since yesterday they are there. Nobody can come in there and get those people. All, all them are neighbors, relatives, kids, family, father, sister, brother. This is my father. As a reporter, I felt helpless in a situation where people so desperately needed medical aid and rescue. The living were camped outside the rubble of what had been their homes. On the opposite side of the street, they were laying out the dead. The worst affected were those living below the poverty line who make up the vast majority of this country's population of 10 million people. I watched as calmly and without outside help, Haitians helped each other. These were the first stories that I filed for Al Jazeera in Haiti. This is where people have come to sleep. They say they're afraid to go back into their houses. They think something else might happen. In one corner of the square, there's even a woman having a baby.
daylight failed to bring relief from the suffering. It merely revealed the extent of the destruction across the city. Everyone we met had harrowing stories about what they had experienced. One of them was a language teacher who'd lost members of his family and his home in the disaster here in Port-au-Prince. I've arranged to meet up with him one last time before I leave Haiti. When the air starts shaking and say, what was that? And I tried to come in and everything collapsed, everything broke down. And I said, wow, what is that? And uh, suddenly I hear uh, people crying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And you see people crying white uh, because of uh, dust. I met survivors who were convinced Armageddon had begun and that Jesus Christ was soon to return. The Messiah failed to appear, but more surprisingly, so did help from outside. There is only one ambulance service in Port-au-Prince. It's owned and run by Ralph Senecal. He doesn't charge those who can't afford it for the service, but accepts donations to pay for fuel. Ralph was the only person that I saw that first night delivering medical aid. And I went down the street, I see people coming, yelling, people blood all over, you know, and people start coming, Ralph, can you help me, can you help me? I said, okay, put him there, put him there. And I was, so many people was here, I didn't know what to do. I was the only one here doing, giving people, you know, first aid. I did not realize that I was alone because I was too busy trying to save life to save these people from bleeding, from infection, you know, little kids crying. This is my last pair of gloves, you know? So somebody got to come and help us. We have to help each other because there were a few people from other country. We got to help each other. That's it, you can see people with a hammer try to find if my daughter out or if is under the harbor. In this news report that we filed three days after the earthquake, Haitians were digging victims from the rubble by hand. This man was struggling to get to the bodies of his three children buried under tons of concrete. His wife was being consoled by the neighbors Scenes like this were being repeated all over Port-au-Prince. And the question everyone was asking was, where were the rescue teams? One of the explanations that I've heard for why there were so few international rescue workers in the streets after nightfall following the earthquake was that they had security concerns. But what I found were not people who were angry, but people who were traumatized, desperate, certainly, and mostly in need of help. A resident of Haiti for much of the past 15 years, anthropologist Tim Schwartz has written extensively about the work of aid agencies in Haiti. When the earthquake struck, he volunteered to assist one of the first international rescue teams to arrive here. In downtown Port-au-Prince, the city's main nursing school had collapsed, Tim and the rescuers arrived there as night was falling. People immediately started telling us there were 110 nurses in the school when it collapsed, and that there were survivors, and they'd been talking to them. The crowd was coming under complete control. There was police there. The crowd was on the far side of the street. It was family and relatives of, girl, of women in the school. The chief rescuer evaluated the situation and called in on his radio that all hell had broken loose and to destroy a building that people in the crowd were telling us there were live people in, and we, we laughed. But well, that's when I realized that we were having two completely different experiences. I saw a, a, a crowd under control that wanted to help, that would have done anything we asked them to do. It was glad that we arrived. And what he saw was hostility and danger. The anticipation of danger from angry Haitians seemed to affect other aspects of the international rescue effort. We filmed the arrival of thousands of US troops at the city's airport. The soldiers may have come to help, but the automatic weapons and armor spoke of another less benign role. Given control of the city's airport, they landed aircraft with military equipment, while several planes loaded with medical aid were turned away. 
Outside the airport, we met Haitians waiting for help, alarmed by what they saw. Les pays de l'Amérique latine, donc nous faisons la promotion de la démocratie dans le monde. We don't need soldiers as such. You know, there's no war here. I don't know of any situation of uh, rescue and, and disaster relief that calls for this level of armed forces. It's going to completely distort and, and miss the purpose of uh, bringing aid to a country in need. More than a year after filing that story, I've caught up with Patrick for one last chat. Did he still think that security concerns had affected the initial aid response? This feeling of fear was uh, all over the mind of the foreign nationals that came to Haiti, either as journalists or rescue workers or aid workers. Uh, I think they've been fed this propaganda for so long that they were prisoners of it. They thought they would come in a country rioting, you know, with violence, people running amok. And they came ready for that kind of scenario. And it didn't play out. In those crucial first few weeks, I never saw incidents of violence or rioting. But I was aware that merely the expectation of it was having an impact on the rescue effort. Even the UN peacekeepers, who'd been in Haiti since 2004, seemed to be affected. I recall the first time we came across them on the streets. The situation was critical. And I remember the scene very, very clearly. There was a huge crowd gathered at the top of this street here, being held back by the Haitian police. There was real tension in the air. And that's because there were people trapped inside this building here. This was the biggest supermarket in Port-au-Prince, and it had entirely collapsed with floors pancaking one on top of the other. And inside, there were more than 60 people trapped inside, still alive. And it must have been about two or three hours after we arrived, when the UN troops finally got to the scene. And it was a woman who came out of the crowd holding her mobile phone saying she'd received a text message from her relative who is still alive and trapped underneath the rubble. What happened? Adolfo, he's in there. He sent a text message. He's by the refrigerators. Yes, he's alive. Inside. My cousin, he just sent a text message. Please go save him. Plus, with all this going on, I don't know what to do. Sir, can you do something, please? Sir? Yes. What are you doing? Did you call the commander? I had to report first. Yeah, yeah. But how long is that going to take? As we watched the UN soldiers focus their efforts on stopping looters, Families of those trapped inside despaired of waiting for the rescue effort to begin. After surviving for three days, Cristina Pato's cousin Adolfo lost his fight for life, like the dozens of others buried alive in the supermarket. After China's earthquake in 2008, close to 90,000 people were pulled from the rubble. In Haiti, nearly 1,800 international rescuers saved just 132 people. But the head of the UN mission in Haiti claims the rescue was a success and that chaos on the ground actually saved lives. It is true that in the very beginning there was no coordination and I think it was better that way. We had more than 58 international rescue teams with dogs and experts were working in the rubble and they just landed here and they went around. So I think it was better in the very beginning, the first weeks, not to have any coordination mechanisms because I think that that spont spont spontaneity really helped, I mean, uh, uh, saving lives uh, around, around, around the country. The rescue effort it was a massive failure. They call it a success. They call it a well-coordinated effort. When everybody was here, you, myself, 
Almost everybody who was on the ground knows that it was a massive failure. It was an opportunity to learn from something, too. There's no question that our perception of Haiti is a major component, and it's not the only component, but a major component in the failure of the, of the earthquake effort. People were afraid of Haiti. The press went wild selling sensational stories about Haiti. Murder, mayhem, voodoo even got in on it. But there was probably never a safer moment in Port-au-Prince. I mean, the people, it was a crisis, people needed help. The rescue mission was called off after 11 days. It was now time for the relief effort to begin. But the problems of helping Haiti to recover were compounded by its extreme poverty. This is one of the poorest countries in the world. And, as I was to learn, the causes have as much to do with its past as its present. This was the first place that I came to the night we arrived after the earthquake had hit. I remember back then this square was filled with thousands of people gathered here, too afraid to go back into their houses. You can see the huge camp that's now sprung up more than a year later. And all around this square there are statues to heroes of a revolution that took place more than 200 years ago. It's a history I knew nothing about when I arrived here, but this was the world's first successful slave revolt when Haitians overthrew their colonial masters, the French. But France demanded billions of dollars in compensation, crippling Haiti's economy for the next 150 years. More recently, Haiti has suffered under policies that have opened up the country to economic exploitation from abroad. Much of the damage occurred during dictatorships that suppressed all opposition. Bobby Duval was a political prisoner during the nation's most violent times. He now runs a football school for children from Haiti's poorest neighborhoods. In 1804, a bunch of slaves, joining with some local forces, decided that they would abolish slavery. And that sent shockwaves to the system. So I think that ever since, Haiti has been ostracized, in the sense that they've, they've tried to coordinate off and not make it an example. They certainly didn't enhance it. In the International Division of Labor, it's very hard to replace us because we are the lowest wage paying, we are the least infrastructure, the level of poverty is the most extreme. They are used to having that bottom line that is very difficult for us to change that bottom line, unless something really extraordinary happens. Nothing could be more extraordinary than what hit Haiti that January afternoon. An act of nature at least offered the opportunity of a new beginning. After decades of international policy that had made Haiti totally dependent on foreign aid, world leaders now spoke of a desire to build Haiti back better. NGOs, or non-governmental organizations, began the recovery effort with the millions of dollars raised from donations from a sympathetic world. This is the post-earthquake landscape that I saw when I arrived in Haiti. The hills of Port-au-Prince covered in rubble and tarpaulins handed out by NGOs. Now, when the international donors met in New York for their conference to decide the amount of money that should be given to Haiti to help it recover from this disaster, I remember feeling hopeful that the more than $11 billion could make a real difference here. And funds were needed, urgently. Haiti's season of tropical storms was about to begin. As we started to file stories on the work of the NGOs, it became apparent that aid, and particularly shelter, wasn't reaching many of those who needed it most. According to the UN, every displaced household in Haiti is now supposed to have received two of these tarpaulins free of charge. But the reality for many of these families is that they're having to buy their shelter materials on the black market. You can clearly see here that these tarpaulins are distribution material from some of the UN agencies. They're now on sale in the black market for a thousand gourds. It's just over Three months after the earthquake, there still weren't even enough tents to go around. 
let alone houses. And it wasn't just the rains that were adding to the appalling conditions. Poor or non-existent security in the camps meant incidents of rape were on the rise. Something needed to be done. The Haitian government proudly unveiled its plan. Someone once described the aftermath of the earthquake to me in an interesting way, saying it was like the poor people of Haiti, who'd always been behind walls, were finally out on the streets saying, here we are, deal with us. Now for 8,000 of them, that camp down there, more than an hour's drive from Port-au-Prince, known as Corail, was how the authorities envisioned dealing with them. But when we first arrived with those first few families, this was a barren lunar landscape. This was meant to be a humanitarian operation, but it was also a photo opportunity for senior figures from the NGO community. Even the president of Haiti made an appearance, but the fanfare failed to impress the families who were being relocated to Corail. We filmed with Naomi Pierre and her mother Jumelia, who were so upset with their new home, they had to be persuaded to stay. The families had been promised shelter from the storms, but the shelters hardly looked up to the job. There was neither electricity nor a permanent supply of water. At the end of that day, the official delegation returned to the capital. The handful of families were now on their own and left to wonder how after three months and millions of dollars spent, the global relief effort hadn't come up with a better solution than this. I've returned to Korai a year later. I wanted to find the woman who, with her daughter, had featured in our story about this new model camp. Jumelia Aristide still lives in Korai, but now is housed in what's described as a transitional shelter. There are still no jobs here and her home is not stormproof. Jumelia lives in this plywood box with nine other family members. Mm. <laughs> Jumelia told me that she's had little expectation from the start that international aid would make a real difference to her life. Whatever hope I had in the relief effort was to disappear with the events that unfolded next. I've been reporting from Haiti for Al Jazeera ever since an earthquake killed thousands and left the country in ruins on the 12th of January 2010. Part of my assignment has been to document conditions for people made homeless by the disaster. For Haitian-American Regine Théodat, it's been a full-time job. Regine works for LAMP for Haiti, an organization that monitors the work of NGOs in the camps. The sanitation was extraordinarily poor. Um, in one particular cat, um, camp, the French Red Cross had set up latrines uh, where there had been no system to clean them out. So the over 70,000 people had a handful of latrines and they weren't even clean. Regine's findings don't come as a surprise. Over the year, we've reported on the gap between need and delivery of aid in the camps. And one of the most frequent complaints was a shortage of drinking water. We filmed at camps similar to those Regine had been monitoring and spoke with organizations like the American Red Cross who were providing water to the camps. This water distribution truck comes around the camp about four times a day distributing water to the residents, but it's not water that they can drink. They say that when they do drink it, it makes them ill, but they simply don't have access to anything else. So our recommendation is always to boil the water if you can, or to buy the drinking water if they can, that is salt. I mean, that's impossible for a lot of Almost Asians, impossible, right? so, yeah. I mean, how, yeah. Why, why is it not possible to get drinking water delivered? I'm sorry? Why is it not possible to distribute drinking water? It's difficult. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. Difficult also meant expensive. But the American Red Cross had raised around half a billion dollars for aid to Haiti by the beginning of 2011. 
At that point, they were hoping to have spent only half of that money. And they weren't the only NGO with a spending shortfall. Mercy Corps, like the American Red Cross, is one of the world's largest and best funded relief organizations. I visited one of their camps and got a guided tour of their work there. OK, that one is hard to open. We should fix that. So how does this work? Oh, people, um, it, yeah, people need to, to bring their own bucket, but it's basically providing privacy. Before we um, built the, they basically shower stalls. They're not a shower as you might have in your house, but you have like water that comes from above. Right. Um, because yeah. again, it's a, a question of cost. So like it's essentially just a structure. And um, what we need to do with this one is to improve the drainage. We put some gravel down, but you can see like the gravel has worn away as it's been used. So we need to go back and, um, and add some more gravel, certainly. And then um, we'll upgrade with a, a layer of cement as we did in the other ones. And how long is it been like this? Oh, not, not for very long. Um, okay. hmm. By the end of October 2010, Mercy Corps had raised $45 million for Haiti Aid Relief, but the organization had only spent less than a third of that. At many of the camps in which I filmed, services seemed to be suffering for lack of funds. The resources are definitely available. I think we in the United States and we in the international community know better than anyone in Haiti how much money that has been donated to these NGOs to do this kind of work. I don't think anyone who donated money to the NGOs is expecting this to be the outcome. Now in Haiti, there are more NGOs per capita than any other country in the world. But such is the appalling conditions of many of these camps and the apparent lack of progress overall since the earthquake that here in Haiti, the expression NGO, or ONG as they call them here, has become something of a dirty word. It's a reputation that precedes the earthquake. NGOs have been in Haiti long before the disaster. Ben Dupuy, editor of weekly newspaper Haiti Progrès, has been following their work since 1983. They call Haiti the Republic of NGO. I don't know, I think we have something close to 10,000. And what they are doing, they're living like tourists. Uh, in big hotels, uh, they eat well, they have cars, air conditioning, etc. And uh, they're having a good time. And uh, then they make a little distribution of this or that. Uh, no accounting, no, they don't report to anyone how much money they receive and how much they've spent. They have not to report what, where the money goes. Nobody knows exactly how many NGOs operate in Haiti, because many don't even bother to register with the authorities. But it's been the job of the UN and its partners to coordinate the work they do. And those officials point to successes rather than failure. NGOs, from what I can see, the, the work they do you know, is phenomenal. Keeping these people alive and, broadly speaking, safe. You know, I'm not saying that everything has been perfect, far from it, but I think there's a lot, to be, a lot to be said for the work that's being done. Surely the aim's got to be more than just keeping them alive. It's about helping people to recover from a disaster. At the end of the day, you've got a massive urban event, an earthquake in a very congested urban area. But uh, uh, you've got to look after people. You, you can't simply say, well, um, let's just leave them, you know. In October of 2010, rumors of a violent sickness brought us to a town on the banks of the Artibonite River in central Haiti. This is the sole water source flowing through Haiti's agricultural heartland. Our story from the region revealed a new disaster. Cholera had infected the Artibonite. We arrived at the hospital at the epicenter of the outbreak and saw patients dying by the hour from acute dehydration. It was a nightmare scenario in a country already on its knees. Officials here tell us that they've received 43 bodies just over the course of the night. They're expecting to receive many more bodies throughout the day. Now for Haitians, more than anything, this came to symbolize the failure of an international recovery effort, which at that point had been going on for nearly a year and had already spent millions of dollars graffiti like this was going up on walls across Port-au-Prince. 
This was a country that had never before seen an outbreak of cholera. One of the most pressing questions at the time was how did this start? We'd heard that there had been a sewage spill at a base for UN Nepalese soldiers in a town on the banks of the Artibonit River, 60 kilometers northeast of the capital. Cholera is a waterborne disease, and untreated waste running into a river is one way it can spread. Are these, are these toilets here? Are these toilets? Yeah. This is a toilet right here? What are you digging? Why are you digging here? Well, we're not being told exactly what's going on here, but it certainly smells like sewage. There are toilets right there, and the liquid seems to be draining into this river just a few meters away that flows into the nearby town of Mirbalé. The UN's first reaction was to deny responsibility. There has also been a rumor that, um, that the Nepalis uh, in, in Mirabale are a source of, of cholera. We have taken samples from the river and they've been confirmed by the National Laboratory to be negative. But this initial confidence was misplaced. Following Al Jazeera's report, the UN was compelled to conduct a thorough inquiry. Six months later, the report concluded that the source of the outbreak was due to contamination of the Artibonit River as a result of human activity. It went on to say that the particular strain of the disease was Vibrio cholera, the type originating in South Asia, where the Nepalese soldiers were from. Before leaving Haiti, I've come back to the town where we first reported that story. The Nepalese soldiers are still here, residents are still washing with water from the local river, and cholera has not gone away. And just over there, there's a cholera clinic where they say they're now receiving more patients than they know how to deal with. Just recently, the number of cholera cases here has risen from 25 to 80 per day. I'm meeting with the medical director, Dr. Choronfant, to find out what's being done to prevent the disease. The biggest concern when cholera first appeared was that the disease might spread from the countryside to Port-au-Prince. The impact of a cholera outbreak on a densely populated city with appalling sanitation was unimaginable. And then, the unimaginable happened. Cholera hit the camps and became a nationwide epidemic. In a country still reeling from a natural disaster, cholera has taken hold and is here to stay. Around 350,000 people have been infected. More than 6,000 have died. A further 800,000 are expected to contract the disease this year. As I'm closing down the Al Jazeera Bureau in Haiti, I recall that like many foreign journalists unfamiliar with this country, I arrived to report a disaster equipped for trouble. Flak jackets, helmets, gas masks. You know, Haiti's got this reputation as a very violent, dangerous place, but we haven't really seen that. And I think that's what's really been brought home to me, the way that Haitians have been able to deal with all these hardships that they've been facing all year. There's never been a time when we've had to use this or wear these. There was one point, though, towards the end of 2010, when people did get angry. And there was some real tension on the streets. I've been told that elections in Haiti are often times of tension, as hopes for change clash with powerful interests protecting the status quo. 
this time with more than a million still homeless and thousands sick and dying from cholera. It was no surprise when anger exploded onto the streets. Despite fury over the elections being held at all, voting went ahead. The ruling party was accused of fixing the results in favor of its candidate, Jude Celestin. With billions of dollars of aid money at stake, the international community grew nervous of supporting a government so publicly accused of fraud. They threatened to withdraw aid unless the results were changed. But on the streets, protesters accused both the government and the foreigners of trying to hijack the election. Now they try to give us a fake president, fake senate, fake deputy. The people Asian say no. Now we want revolution. After intense international pressure, Celestan was disqualified and a runoff vote held between two candidates with little popular support. Finally, although only 16% of the electorate voted for him, Haiti got a new president, Michel Martelly. Martelly comes to office proclaiming that Haiti is open for business. But everyone agrees that before the country can move forward, the fate of those still displaced by the earthquake must be resolved. This is the last story I'll be filing as Al Jazeera's correspondent in Haiti. Here we go. Three, two, one. This is Camp Accra. It's home to more than 25,000 people, but it's actually situated on private land owned by one of the wealthiest families in Haiti, the Accra family. And in this tent behind me, the camp committee members are meeting with representatives of NGOs. Now, we asked permission to film this meeting, but we were told that we couldn't. Why? Why? We've heard that there's a new strategy in place to move displaced families out of the camps, even though there's still nowhere for them to go. Excuse me. Excuse me. Are you from the ARC? ARC? Yeah, yes. Are you, are you running this camp? Are you helping to provide the services here? Je peux pas parler avec toi? Well, the representatives from the NGO didn't want to speak with us, certainly not on camera, and I was trying to ask him exactly what was discussed inside that tent, and he wouldn't say, but from what we understand, the NGO is starting to withdraw its services here because the landowner wants his property back. Businessman Sebastian Acre owns land all over Haiti, including this camp of 25,000. Two months ago, he gave the people here notice to leave. He says the NGOs have agreed to help clear the camp of residents. Instead of managing the camp, try to see how you can move the people from the camp. Because the more they manage the camp, the less the people are encouraged to leave the camps. That's what I ask the NGOs. So is this a way of getting those residents off the land? Yeah, that's a way to get people to move. Um, whether it's the good way or the right way or the wrong way, I don't know. But you need the you land know? back? I need the land back. It's a private land and it's, it's a message, especially if you want to encourage foreign investment, it's a message the right to land ownership is respected. This camp used to get water delivered by an NGO, but the service has been withdrawn because the entire camp is facing eviction. It means these residents are now paying for their own water. It's only around 10 cents per bucket, but when you consider that most Haitians live on less than $2 a day, and that many residents of this camp won't have a job at all, it's a considerable financial outlay. The NGOs are reluctant to tell me what they're doing, but they have informed the head of the camp committee that they're winding down their operations. Camp Accra is not unique. Across the city, NGOs are withdrawing services at camps where landowners are demanding evictions. 
With this year's storm season in full swing and cholera on the rise, it seems like the wrong time to be leaving. Officials in charge of coordinating aid to the camps say it's because the money has run out. The non-governmental organisations are running out of resources to maintain the camps. They're also taking you know, a position, a mature position, which is that it's time to move on. It's time for the camps to run themselves, for the Haitians to pull up their socks and look after themselves. Can you understand why people might be surprised to hear that the NGOs are running out of money? Well, they need to understand the cost of running a camp. I mean, it's incredibly expensive. To, if you're trucking water, it costs. You've got a vehicle. Try renting a vehicle to go 100 miles a day. It's going to cost you a bit. The water is going to cost you a bit. Now imagine doing this for a 1,000 camps. It's an exponential cost, and it's unsustainable. Everybody recognizes that NGOs have been a complete failure, at least in Haiti, that the entire the entire system is a, is a mess. Since the earthquake, they've spent almost $2 billion, at least $2 billion. Most of that money, it's hard to see where it went. And if you want to know why, all you have to do is look at how much money they spent and how much it costs these NGOs to function. Haiti might have 10,000 foreign NGO workers. $150 a day for car, 10,000 aid workers. $3,000 a month, 10,000 aid workers for their apartment. $200 a day salary. Another, let's say, be very conservative, say $100 a day per diem. I think the going rate for the UN is $250 per day. I've already hit about $1.67 billion just in those figures. There is no money left over for the poor people who the money was given to help. All of these NGOs are pulling out. So what you see here is what the NGOs and what the international community and what the Haitian government has pushed as what the recovery effort is. And if you look at these tarps and these tents, and this is what people are going to be living in now with NGOs here. Imagine what they're going to be living in when NGOs aren't here, even with the mediocre amount of aid or amount of change that has been seen. As the NGOs pack up, it now falls to the country's new president to lead Haiti towards recovery. I've been following Martelly, a former musician known as Sweet Mickey, since he first began campaigning for office. He's styled himself as a man of the people, but it appears that doesn't include people living in the camps. People need to be moved out of the camps. You know, people leave their homes, they come into the tents because they know that there they're going to have free food, free, free water, free assistance, and, and they won't be paying for rent. They won't be paying rent. They won't be paying electricity. So some people are living in the, under the tents, but it's more like a business deal than, than actually living under the tents. So Haiti's new president seems to believe people have actually chosen to abandon their homes for life in camps like this. The truth is, most of these families don't have anywhere else to go. And there are no more free handouts, only a cholera epidemic that's about to get worse. In the many months that I've reported from Haiti, there are issues that I've been drawn to time and again after speaking with Haitians about what they needed most. The effectiveness of the NGOs, the security supposedly provided by the UN, how the money raised by international donors is being used, and the performance of the Haitian government itself. As I reflect on how I've reported these stories, I'm looking at the track record of those entities too, and it seems to me they've fallen short. Life for Haitians just looks too similar to how it did soon after the earthquake. So for me, as for many of the Haitians that I've met, I can't help but wonder, does the will really exist to build Haiti back better? It's an illusion to think that. But the system cannot accept for us to move up that ladder. They can give you things to, to give you the impression that you know the relief work and but I don't think they really want to structurally make you on a different path. Haiti has to be made to fail and also promoted as an example. Try to be the master of your own destiny. This is what will happen to you. But the people of Haiti, their resilience, their, their, their love of life and their creativity. This is what will actually save Haiti. Papa 
ramener toujours absent pour l'homme de présent depuis c'est pour bon bâton. Songez, l'homme te gagne 10 ans. Pas comme ça, yon vele l'homme ou maman yon bagay yon fait pour son pareil. Songez, l'homme If there is any hope of a new generation emerging to lead Haiti from its crisis, they'll probably be listening to these guys, Mystic 703, with lyrics condemning the UN, NGOs, politics and cholera. They're hugely popular in Haiti. My last stop before leaving is to meet the band whose music became the soundtrack to my time here. What's up, Mr. Sebastian? Hey, merci pour me recevoir en émission là. Ah, ouais, super, super, super. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so difficult, you understand, in this country. I mean, all the problems, so we need solution. That's why we keep on asking for it in our music and our lyrics. Mm. Do you think things are going to get any better? Do you have any optimism, you guys? We have faith in Haitian people. We have faith in the country just because uh, we are... I ain't gonna say the strongest people in the world, but we are so strong. We, we're never gonna give give up the fight. So That's it. of so course we're, we're gonna keep on fighting because we got faith that one day everything's gonna change. So we hope and we're gonna work for things to come to better. be better. Yeah. Yes. That's it. All of these disasters that have happened this year with the earthquake, cholera, hurricanes. Elections, the list just goes on and on. What is it that is behind the strength of the Haitians that they can just keep going through all of this? Nowadays, they're talking about reconstruction of the country, but this piece of earth doesn't stay the same. I mean, there's a way to do it physically, but we gotta rebuild our mentality equality. Haiti is us, Haiti is for us, Haiti is us. And the second thing is try to stay positive. Thanks so much for having us on your show. We really appreciate it. And shout out goes out to Al Jazeera channel. So I really appreciate Big it. Up to me. Big up to you, Sebastian Walker. Sebastian, everybody, everybody. So look at that plan, people.